for some reason my cam is not on. Can you can you see me? No, I cannot see myself. Yes, I can see. Yes, you can see you. Okay, but she is very strange because I cannot see myself. Anyway, um, right. So we're recording the class, and we're doing uh, um, the chapter on the diva. And before the recording started, I was talking to you about your impressions about the chapter. We uh, we were talking about uh, what what goes into the making of a diva and, and whether this applies to Madonna uh, or not. Um, and I'm still asking you. Um, do, do you think the rules and regulation and the criteria that we set for a diva? Uh, defining and describing and making, uh, do you think they apply to Madonna? No, because her voice is not strong and good. My voice or her voice? <laughs> no, her voice. <laughs> OK, <laughs> OK, yeah, that's uh, uh, so that the first uh, you know, normally when when you uh, give that qualification diva for someone, we normally look for the quality of voice. And like Toa is saying, uh, with um, Madonna, it's different. It's uh, it's not. I mean, of course, her voice matures over the years, but that is not the only reason we're we're giving her. Uh, the title for the label diva. It's uh, it's a lot of other things. Do you still remember those uh, other things that we spoke about? Yes, I think it was about uh, how she was manipulating her business in a, uh, in a clever way. Mm -hmm. How she was uh, always uh, coming out in a, in a different fashion every time she do something. Uh, to appeal to a certain group of people. Yeah, OK. So it's it's about manipulating her own image. It's uh, about keeping her audience on the, their toes, if you like, where they are so excited about uh, um, what uh, what is next. I mean, they know that she is uh, quite unpredictable in terms of uh, how she dresses, in terms of how she looks. Um, and th this is media manipulation, and she did it very well, right? This was, of course, before the internet, let alone uh, if she is around now, right? Um, so again, um, uh, part of the credit uh, would also go uh, to the fact that she she was a good business manager. She managed the business of media, the her singing business very well. Um, OK, but uh, this is obviously different from traditional divas and traditional divas would focus more on their voices. You would give the label or the qualif qualification diva uh, to somebody whose voice is, uh, you know, uh, out of this world, if, if you like. Uh, um, and that used to happen with especially with opera. Uh, singers in the past. Uh, again, you need to uh, always remember that Madonna uh, was never an opera singer. She she cannot qualify uh, to uh, to be um, uh, an opera singer given the fact that her voice is weak and everything. Uh, so we're moving from uh, Madonna to somebody else, and this somebody else, uh, uh, um, uh, Maria Callas, is. Um, did you check the pronunciation of Callas? Is it Callas, Callas? And because I'm, uh, I, I think I asked you to kind of check how her name is pronounced. I didn't do my homework, but you, you should have done that. Uh, have you have you done? Yes. Ah, yes. It is yeah. uh, Callas. Callas. Yeah. Yes, Callas. Yeah. I'm very intuitive. Uh, okay. So uh, Callas is different because uh, in order to judge. Uh, hair and hence uh, gave her the, the title or the label diva. We were going to uh, um, judge her on the merit of her voice, whether her voice 
would qualify her for uh, a diva status or not. And she succeeded in that. She was uh, brilliant when it comes to the quality of her voice, but uh, she needed some drama into her life, which she had. And by drama, of course, I mean that she um, she will have a bit of suffering, uh, getting separated from her husband, falling in love with somebody who then walks out on her. Those uh, dramatic atmospheres that we are normally uh, beset with. Uh, does she have this measure? Yes, she she does have uh, that, and that would uh, uh, would be added to uh, uh, the qual the super quality of her voice. And uh, she will, she 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 would be given the label or the status diva. Somebody is raising her hand. Go ahead. Yes, doctor. My name is Rowan. Uh, doctor, uh, so the diva will never be about Um Kaltum, just Madonna yeah. and uh, Maria. Yeah, I mean, if if Um Kal uh, Um Kaltum. <laughs> Kaltum. <laughs> um Kaltum. I'm sorry. Uh, if Um Kaltum, uh, I mean, meets the the criteria, and I think she does. She she as she is our diva in the Arab world. لأن بعض الكتب كانوا حاطين صورة أم كلثوم فأنا فكرت إنه دذيبة هي كلها بتتكلم عن أم كلثوم فكنت مرة متحمسة دحين بعد ما شفت مادونا جاني إحباط صراحة. إيه بس لا مادونا إس فاين أم كلثوم إس فكلهم فيهم خير يا روان. I think أم كلثوم can can يعني can qualify for a diva status given the fact that her quality of voice is also very uh, uh, super and very um, um, yeah it's yeah again it's out of this world like they say um, again she you would have to check into uh, what kind of life she used to lead and uh, uh, but definitely Umm Kulthum is our diva in the Arab world uh, okay so let's go to Maria and see what uh, she is all about. Bismillah. Yeah. So this is our friend Maria Callas. Uh, did you do any research on or about Maria Callas? Yani out of curiosity, perhaps. No. Hmm. No. Huh? Are you saying no or yes? For me, no. No. What did I do? I need to go to the slides. Where are the slides? It is open. I will have slides. Okay. So can you see the slides? I'm sharing the slides. Hello. Yes, doctor. Okay, you can see them. So Maria Callas, everyone. Um, again, if Madonna is um, like um, a late 20th century. Um, it's a, it's on, we can't see the, the slide. Yeah, the slide. Can, any, can, can anybody see them? Because I'm sharing them. It is down. It is down. We, we only see you. Yeah, I think you'll have to kind of wait a little bit. And, um, the internet is a little bit sluggish and slow here. Can can does this apply to everyone? Can't you see the slides, everyone? I can't see it. It's clear. Okay. So um, can I ask you to kind of go out and come back? Perhaps that would solve the problem. Yeah, Brazil. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, we're uh, talking about Maria Callas, which is obviously a different. Uh, kind of diva where uh, here the focus is on the quality of voice. 
um, she is an opera singer and spoke about opera before and what uh, opera uh, um, I mean connotes. Um, uh, opera, um, I think you're familiar with it. Would the one big quality that uh, you have to check in an opera singer would be uh, her and his voice. I mean, the voice has to be very, very strong. It's like, uh, well, I don't know, I'm not an opera singer for that. Uh, I would fall and fail very miserably when it comes to the test of, uh, of opera singing. So Maria Callas was probably the most famous opera star of the mid 20th century. Um, again, they, uh, opera singers are, are famous. Uh, yeah, they, they are, uh, especially in Europe where there is uh, uh, this interest in opera, especially in Italy. If you move even further, it's Italy uh, where uh, you normally have opera singers and where you have appreciation of opera singing. So let, let me ask you whether uh, opera is uh, among your favorites or not. Do you like opera singing? Uh, singing, of course, and watching, because there is obviously more to opera than just uh, uh, watch, uh, I mean, singing. It's a whole spectacle where you have, you know, the opera singer sing, singing and also uh, acting uh, on the stage. Um, and, and, and more or less like a play, but this play is done in uh, a loud voice. So are you into uh, this kind of thing? Do you like opera? No. <laughs> okay. Who, who does? Who likes uh, opera and opera singing? I do. Mm. I do. Uh, what's your name? Sumaya. Sumaya. So, Sumaya is into opera singing. So if you're into opera singing, are you familiar with any of the existing singers? Do you have anybody in mind? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, when I say Pavarotti, Pavarotti is um, obviously all over the place, but he, I think he's dead now. Um, I don't know about female uh, opera singers, I mean, living I one. Heard her name. Oh. So uh, there is obviously nothing unusual about an opera singer uh, becoming famous. They are famous, especially in Europe. Um, and we're talking about different uh, opera singers. They are the, the male, male sopranos, sopranos are uh, singers uh, whose voice is very loud and strong and everything. So that you have the Castarati of the 18th uh, century um, to the three uh, tenors, which is tenors, obviously, and this is how they say it, and I think in Italy and also in English. Uh, and in some com uh, comprising the tenors, uh, Jose Car Car Carras, Placido Domingo, yeah, the Placido, Placido Domingo is uh, very famous also, and Luciano Pavarotti. Pavarotti uh, is or was very famous. Uh, they were put together initially to sing at the World Cup finals, uh, which were held in Italy in 1990. Um, uh, you still have top opera singers uh, who have always attracted attention beyond the roles in the theater. Um, uh, I think in the Arab world, we're not uh, you know, a culture of opera. We're more into uh, uh, our own music and our own way of singing, which is Oriental and Eastern. Um, so what is interesting about Callas, if everybody can uh, qualify, if, if, I mean, if, if every opera singer can qualify for a diva or divo, what is interesting uh, um, or unique about uh, uh, Callas? Um, Callas is, however, regarded as a special case, partly for musical reason and partly for reasons that go beyond music. See, so it's not only music, it's not only singing, it's music and a dash extra. What, what is this dash extra? It's her personal life and how she uh, um, 
uh, in her life, how she enacts uh, um, whatever rules she plays on the state as an oppressor. Um, we will attempt to tease out some of the reasons why she uh, was and continues to be so famous. Uh, <clears throat> interesting uh, pieces um, of trivia about her what would be the fact that her career as a singer was very short. Um, she made her uh, breakthroughs uh, as a, an opera, as a famous opera singer in the 1940s. Uh, and 10 years later, she stopped appearing regularly on the opera stage. She was only 42 when she finally retired from the stage and she died at the age of just 54. You see, her lifespan is very short, right? And also her career was, was even shorter. Um, uh, and this is very strange because she has uh, all what it takes to become um, a diva. And she was already a diva, of course. And part of her diva uh, status is attributable to the fact that she had a short lifespan and she also had uh, a very short life, uh, uh, life I mean, uh, career, I'm sorry. Um, again, um, if she is in the limelight and in the public eye, people would kindly follow her and ask about her news and, and everything. And one big uh, um, opportunity was uh, the fact that she lost weight uh, tremendously uh, and that was the town talk. Everybody spoke about how she could lose uh, um, such um, a big amount of weight. Uh, remember, and I think you, you know, I mean, most of the opera singers that uh, at least I see are normally overweight or they are fat. So um, she she changed this perception by the by losing uh, a tremendous weight in 1954, and that came as a surprise. That came. Uh, this also was welcomed by her fans and followers. She became a glamorous figure, and was subjected to intense public scrutiny. Uh, she was in the public eye, and people started to talk about why she. Uh, how she could do that and that would add to her character and how determined she is and all these kinds of things. Um, when she retired, she did not fall uh, from public view. People were also keeping track of her news. Uh, 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 the decline in her opera appearances coincided with the ending of her marriage and the start of her very public relationship with the most prominent Greek shipping magnet, um, Onassis or Aristotle, uh, Onassis or Onassis, I don't know where the stress applies. Um, so like uh, I said, when, when she retired, you know, when she decided not to sing anymore, she still uh, um, kept her, um, you know, her fan uh, base, people were asking, uh, and following her news. Um, uh, perhaps some, uh, some of the reasons why she uh, decided to stop was uh, the fact that she had, um, uh, um, you know, a failed marriage. Um, and then she started to kind, kind of go out with a prominent uh, um, businessman, uh, Onassis. And uh, of course, Onassis or Onassis himself is very famous. He's a celebrity. Everybody uh, is also uh, speaking about him. So she, she did. She uh, by retiring, she didn't. Uh, people didn't lose interest in on her. Again, what would add to the drama also? Another failure, another relationship failure would would be the fact that. Onassis is going to lose interest in her, and he would go and marry uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, the uh, the wife of uh, John Kennedy, the assassinated uh, president of the U.S. in the 60s. Um, again, 
uh, she's moving from one fail failure to another when it comes to relationships, and that would also attract attention. So she was covered extensively in the press. Um, again, people uh, started to feel somewhat uh, sympathetic towards her. They would uh, consider her a tragic figure. Uh, um, and um, they have their uh, sympathies with her and they would heavily report her. Uh, she spent her last uh, you know, years, the last years of her uh, life as a recluse. Recluse is uh, somebody who um, um, kind of shies away from um, from the lights, uh, somebody who would shun uh, and avoid publicity. She did that in Paris and she 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 died uh, a very uh, lo lonely death. Uh, she reminds me of um, an Egyptian actress by the name of Suat Hosni, if you're familiar with that. She was also all over the place. Everybody is speaking about her. She is she was a kind of um, a household name. And uh, over the years, she started to, uh, you know, kind of um, gain weight and she also uh, tried to avoid um, the press and and she died very tragically in London uh, and people you know, up till uh, part of her drama uh, uh, has to do uh, with the fact that uh, people don't know whether she uh, committed suicide by uh, kind of uh, falling from uh, one of the windows in a very high building or she was pushed. So the part of the drama and part of the appeal comes from the confusion that people normally uh, have about uh, an individual. So uh, Maria, Maria Callas and Suat Hosni are uh, one of a kind in terms of the so many failures in their personal lives that would uh, lead them to to live a very recluse and a very uh, solitary kind of life, and they would die uh, tragically at the end. Um, so again, a uh, part of the diva status of Callus has to do with the fact that uh, people would consider her a tragic figure in acting the roles that she uh, acts in the plays. Most of her plays, most of her operas were full of sadness and misery and frustration. And uh, her fans would go out and say that the sadness and the frustration that she has in real life are enactments uh, and embodiments of, uh, of things that she uh, any kind of perform on the stage. Uh, in the case of an opera singer, and particularly one who is a woman, there is a perception of added buoyancy. Buoyancy means uh, vitality and, um, you know, um, excitement and enthusiasm about something. So you would add to uh, the, the good quality of voice, the uh, uh, um, perceptions about uh, the lady as being tragic, being being uh, you know kind of victimized. So when a female uh, opera singer is revealed as personally vulnerable, she can easily be seen as mirroring in her life aspects of the roles that she has played on the stage. Again, it's it's the correspondence between uh, the actresses. Uh, roles on the stage and her roles on life. There is a great deal of parallel, and that parallel and that correspondence is very appealing to the audience and to the fans. Um, oh, what is uh, even tragic and uh, uh, even uh, interesting would be the fact that there is uh, uh, a great deal. Um, I'm sorry, I have um, an exam running, which is EL112, and I, have, I happen to be the course coordinator, and, and, uh, and the people are ringing me. 
can can I يعني kind of stop for a minute and pick up the phone and see perhaps there is something wrong with the exam? Yes, just doctor. Just a minute, no just. Take your time, doctor. Sorry for that. Um, OK, let's go back to the presentation. And I'm sure you guys are as interesting in the tragic life of this lady as I am, right? OK, um, so again, we, we were talking about the correspondence. Can you see the, the slides? I'm sorry. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, part of the appeal has to do with the correspondence between the actor or the actress's life and her roles uh, or his roles on the stage. So almost all of the characters die on stage or just off stage through illness, suicide or murder or they go mad. <laughs> when you uh, kind of do research on and about um, the divas that we have, uh, they have one of those uh, uh, fates. I mean, committing suicide, uh, getting murdered, and they, and they, they die of a certain illness. So the great tragic roles were Talos 40, and it was all too easy for the public to see this reflected in her personal life. Uh, again, people die, people contract diseases, and nobody cares about them. Yeah, you wouldn't, um, I mean, life is short, and uh, uh, you, 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 you were not, uh, you know, kind of all knowledgeable and all seem to know how many people are, um, have contracted cancer and they are suffering uh, from it or other things. So it's only those who are in the public eye uh, that we normally have interest uh, in. So uh, if she was um, not uh, a public figure, we wouldn't have known about her, of course. So it's all because of her uh, gift as an, an amazing opera singer. She, she did a number of operas, and one of them is uh, um, Tosca, Tosca by Puccini. This is a very famous um, you know, opera in which she, she played the lead role and also uh, there was a great deal of misery to it. For me, uh, so the most important thing in a role like Tosca is not just the quality of the, the voice, but whether the singer manages to make the character and her situation seem real. So while singing and while acting out the role, you would feel that uh, it, it's not a drama that we're, you're seeing. It's not fiction, no. You, she, she would manage through her voice to make you feel that this is real, that the suffering is real, that the miseries are real. Um, and this is actually what makes <coughs> somebody like Callus different. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, opera singer. Admittedly, there are uh, singers who are um, more beautiful when it comes to the quality of voice, but Callus could have those small things, those small intricacies that would uh, kind of, um, um, you know, impress uh, the audience and make them feel that what they are seeing is uh, very real. Uh, so Callas sometimes uh, uh, struggles to control a rather aggressive wobble in her top register, particularly when she sings loudly. 
Uh, but she battled throughout her career against vocal. Uh, she 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 had vocal problems, but again she would make up for that by um, being very careful with those small niceties that would appeal to the audience. So what Callus has, which nobody else has in quite the same way, is an extraordinarily powerful and sensitive way of acting the words as she sings them. So it's not about the singing, it's also about the acting. She is very powerful when it comes to that. Um, so when she sings quietly, her voice has a slightly uh, husky, veiled quality, which can sound tender or vulnerable. So this vulnerability, uh, uh, which is a characteristic of a woman, which is uh, very relatable. You would relate to this vulnerability. You feel that you, you're there uh, on the stage. And she, you, you kind of identify with her and with the role that she plays on the stage, and that would secure uh, appeal and uh, popularity. Uh, again, it's all about conveying violent anguish and anger uh, and then rising to a powerful climax and then subsiding into broken tearfulness. So these are all qualities and elements that she made sure she does very well. And like I said, that would secure the appeal of the audience. Again, she would enhance that with uh, a, the contrasting impression of implacable uh, implacable uh, power and determination given uh, by Bobby as uh, Scarpia. This is another character. The two uh, play off each other magnificently. She she has uh, like um, a partner on the stage, and the symmetry and the harmony is so good that they uh, um, you know kind of help each other rise and shine. <clears throat> Again, um, who, uh, who else helps them in achieving that? It would be the conductor himself. The conductor is the one who manages the orchestra. Um, who, uh, I mean, we have a very famous conductor by the name of Victor Di Sabato, uh, who paces the scene with great power, drawing out the menace the threat and drive uh, all, uh, and the menace and drive of, of the music from the very fine orchestra. Again, this is all about opera and opera houses and how uh, those opera houses are now a mark uh, uh, of refinement. Um, even in cultures where uh, opera, ha uh, opera is not understood or acknowledged or even appreciated by people. You still have uh, countries building opera houses um, and, of course, hosting people and welcoming them in there in order to pass off as advanced and refined. Um, so uh, opera started as a sophisticated uh, court entertainment. When, when when they started this tradition of opera singing, uh, it was only for the selected few, and it was uh, run uh, and conducted in royal uh, palaces. It was only uh, royal families who had access to this kind of uh, art. So again, it started as a sophisticated court entertainment in Italy, and that was at the beginning of the 17th century. Again, they wanted to recreate the principles of ancient Greek drama, but in singing. So the dramas that were familiar in Greek tragedies, they wanted to uh, enact them through singing again for a selected few in royal uh, court houses. Again, like I said, it developed and evolved, and, and opera and opera houses have become symbols of prestige across the world. And the music widely disseminated by recordings and on television. 
Um, again, like I said, uh, Italy is the home or the birth uh, place of, of opera and opera houses. Uh, even the language, the language used in operas for the most part are uh, the language, the Italian language, whether old or new. Um, unlike in other places, um, Italians are very fond of, uh, of uh, opera, whether they are educated or not. It's part of their culture and they are obviously very happy about it. Uh, it unites them. Uh, it's in the, the rich, you can have the rich and the poor attending the same uh, opera performance. So it's a national sport for them. More or less like um, for them. So it is uh, woven into the national culture from the top to the bottom. Uh, again, like I said, it's now the trend that countries, uh, you know, build opera houses. Even if they don't have opera singers or opera performances and opera musicians. Um, how do they look? I mean, opera houses, how do they are often extravagantly uh, Baroque in style. They have a certain European style. Um, with grand st uh, staircases and uh, uh, seats and curtains uh, of a very high quality. Uh, <clears throat> again, they would vary from one country to another, but the pattern and the style is almost the same. Uh, opera houses are a bit glamour. They, they infatuate and fascinate people. Um, so part of the appeal of Maria Callas was her combination of strength and vulnerability. She has the strength of character, the strength of voice, and also the fact that she is very vulnerable, very, very weak as a human being. So in her struggle to succeed, people could all too easily think of her as the incarnation of an opera character like Tosca. So people, um, whenever they knew about her, life, sufferings, and miseries, they would always have the character, uh, the characters that she presents on the stage, like Tosca, invoked. They invoke all these uh, characters. They feel that there is correspondence between the two. Um, again, there, there is a very interesting situation encountered between Tosca, who has the courage to kill the evil uh, Scarpia, but at the end of the opera, Tosca herself is strict. Her lover is dead, and as she is cornered, she flings herself to her death over the battlements of the uh, Castel San uh, Angelo uh, in Rome. Castel or Castle, I think it's Castle. In art and in life, the Callus fan might like to think she was a tragic heroine, like you said. And then we'll move, uh, this is the end, obviously, of Callus and her story, uh, and how tragic her life story was. And that would endear her to her uh, uh, audience. We're moving to a group of female singers. Um, and we're talking way back, we're talking about the uh, uh, 15th and the 16th century. Uh, in in a northern uh, Italian town uh, by the name of Ferrara, uh, where we, we will have a number of female singers. And also, uh, they were also uh, given uh, the status divas. Again, we'll know about their background and how they came to be known as divas. So the northern Italian town of Ferrara was established as a center for the cultivation of the fine arts, especially in music. That was from the 15th century, when the Jew, Duke is like a king, the king of the place, Duke uh, Ercole Ledesti, and excuse my Italian, who reigned between 1471 and 1505, 
was able to attract some of the finest foreign composers to his school. So obviously he was artistic, he was into arts. So I mean, of course, as a, as a king or as a duke, he has his own court. Uh, he would ask, um, you know, he would ask composers, uh, those who uh, write music from different parts of Europe to come over in order to, perform, to write music and also to perform uh, in his court. Um, again, that was the practice, and then over time, another king or another duke uh, by the name of, of, of Alfonso II Dieste, who reigned between 1559 and 1597, uh, also uh, was inherited this uh, interest in music. Um, uh, what is different? Uh, uh, is that this new Jew uh, didn't um, kind of attract a foreign composer, a composer. He would welcome and accommodate, uh, um, you know, music uh, provided by homegrown uh, performer people from uh, within the country, from within the, uh, the country that he rules. So they were local performers. And then we have a very famous composer by the name of uh, Luzat Shi. Um, and this very famous uh, composer was uh, composing music for Alfonso, the Duke. Uh, again, what is interesting is, is that uh, he also had those, um, you know, talent, talent scouting abilities. She could discover new voices and introduce them to the court. Um, so his main contribution to the court uh, represents several sets of madrigals. Madrigals are songs and performances. Uh, um, and those um, madrigals are secular songs, uh, setting Italian text. Although he is also noted for his um, harps chord, I mean, and this is a musical instrument, uh, being a professional keyboard performer himself. So many of his madrigals were written for a group of uh, female singers, and they they came to be known as the um, Delle Doni or the Concerto Delle Doni. And these ladies were famous uh, throughout Italy and many uh, poets and composers became infatuated with them. They liked them very, very much. So again, he is the one who introduced them to the court and he is partly responsible for their popularity. <clears throat> again, what makes uh, those kinds of concerts and those kinds of uh, songs by those ladies very appealing would be the fact that they were not accessible to everyone. They were very private and they were very exclusive to uh, the royal court. So of course you know about something but you don't as a uh, as a layman or as a member of the public you're not allowed access uh, into those uh, councils so you feel that there is something amazing happening and uh, you cannot see. Um, so uh, Alfonso, the Duke, uh, guarded his singing ladies uh, from public spectacle. They were only there in order to entertain him. Um, he never allowed members of the public to go and watch them while performing. Uh, it was only later and much later that uh, people uh, you know, started to see their stuff when when it was published. Uh, so we're talking about Concerto delle Doni. We're talking about the ladies that uh, I have been talking to you about. Um, uh, again, so you're talking about uh, obviously uh, performers. 
and obviously uh, their vocal abilities would be uh, uh, you know invoked whenever we talk about them we talk for first and foremost about uh, how powerful their voices were <clears throat> um, so like i said those ladies uh, um, they came together under the supervision of alfonso uh, and in his court and uh, um, they would form an ensemble a, a team or a band and that was in 1580 and that would attract most most attention from contemporary musicians and court commentators uh, as well as from modern day scholars um, and uh, the, there will be occasions where those uh, ladies are going to perform uh, and during um, a marriage ceremony for example um, um, and, and, yeah, and things of, of the kind, uh, those very happy uh, royal uh, occasions. So who are they and what are their names? They were uh, Laura uh, de Verara, Anna Guarini, Tarquinia Molezza, and Livia de Arco. And they all came from a social background that wouldn't have automatically allowed them to become poetry. So uh, it's only through their singing and the, the quality of their voice that they were given access to the court. Otherwise, their station in life, their status uh, as perhaps middle class uh, ladies wouldn't, wouldn't have allowed them uh, into the court. So they were made courtiers by virtue of their musical ability. It's only through the, the power of their voices that they could have access to the court. And then we uh, speak about every and each one of them. We we'll start with Laura uh, Pivereira, uh, who lived between 50, uh, the 1545 and 1601. And she is the best documented of the four. It means that we know uh, a lot about her uh, uh, compared to the other uh, um, singers. Uh, we, for example, know that she was the daughter of a wealthy merchant in Mantua. Um, and she attracted the poetic attentions of the well-known Italian poet uh, Torquato Tasso. Th this was a very famous uh, poet, and uh, uh, she uh, people uh, you know kind of um, uh, people like him, poets like him, got attracted by uh, her sweet voice. Um, again. Uh, she, uh, he fell obviously in love with her, and he, uh, when he fell in love with her, he wrote 75 poems, um, you know, for her to perhaps sing and uh, praising and glorifying her. Uh, but she didn't get married to him. She married uh, a count. A count is a royal, um, a royal official or a, or a royal family member. She married Count Annibal uh, Turco in 1581. Uh, um, and again, Tasso was there and he made a number of, um, you know, poems, uh, perhaps to mark the occasion. Um, again, those poems and uh, when they were made uh, into songs, they were very appealing and they would reflect her singing uh, abilities and talents. <clears throat> um, because of how uh, talented she was, and I'm talking about Laura Pivereira, uh, even the Duke uh, would help uh, hold her in high regard and, and uh, show respect to her. And uh, one indication of that would be that he accepted her husband as a gentleman of the court, and he provided the couple with the palace apartments that once belonged to his sister, Leonora. And then we move on to Anna Vorani. Um, 
uh, or Gorini. Uh, we don't know much about her. Um, uh, except for the fact that she died uh, in 1598. Uh, she was the daughter of the poet and Terrarasi uh, diplomat Giovanni Battista Gorini. Uh, in uh, the 1580s, she got married to a gentleman of the court named uh, Era Col Trotti, uh, who uh, was overly jealous, obviously, and he ended up killing her out of jealousy, of course. And then we move to Tarakinia um, Mulitsa, the third singer. She was also a daughter of a poet by the name of Francesco Maria Molzo, Molza. Um, she got married in the 60s of the 15th century in 1560, and uh, she uh, got wedded in 1569. Uh, she was only 27 then. She had an affair with somebody, uh, who uh, was a court composer. Uh, um, and because of this affair, she was banished or exiled. Uh, she was banished from court in 1589. And then we have Livia de Arco, who was the daughter of Comte de Arco, uh, who was a minor noble of Mantua. Mantua. She married a courtier um, who um, at one point was a close friend of the Duke. And as a sign of respect and appreciation of her, her and her voice, uh, um, he started some kind of uh, competition uh, with swords with somebody in her honor. Um, Again, we don't know much about those guys, by the way. And uh, we can, uh, there were, of course, you know, there were no recording devices. But all what we hear is hearsay. So people inheriting impressions uh, about them. But we don't know uh, how good uh, and how sweet their voices were. What we only know about for sure would be the music that used to accompany them while singing, because music um, is written. I mean, people can write music, and, and that's easy. Uh, again, this kind of music, like I said, had uh, people who liked it, and uh, there were also people who didn't uh, like it. Um, and there was all uh, styles of singing. Uh, you have solo, you have the way, and you have tray. And they were all accompanied on the harps chord, which which is uh, more or less like uh, a big, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a variation on the guitar, but up fronted and very big, obviously. Uh, again, like I said, that those ladies' voices were amazing. Uh, um, and uh, that was acknowledged by professional musicians. Again, we spoke about the idea that that was a courtly uh, kind of entertainment that was exclusive to uh, courtiers and to uh, the royal family. Again, we were talking about the challenges that music school, uh, scholars are having now. Um, they want to understand the sound and the musical ability of those performers. But how can they do that uh, at a time when there was no recording? So uh, how would they uh, you know, kind of solve the problem? They would uh, depend on two main sources of information. Uh, again, they would depend on contemporary accounts uh, of performances and the music itself. 
but again, nothing about the quality of voice of those uh, you know, ladies because uh, there was no recording like this. Um, so although some writers praise the beauty of the ladies singing, it is not clear from the writings if this is a true reflection of what they heard or whether their words were written to please the Jews. They don't know. I mean, we don't really know whether this was a genuine appreciation of uh, the quality of their voice or was it only to flatter the Duke? Yeah, of course, as a Duke or as a king who is hosting all of that, you can just come and say, no, it's uh, the performance was bad or so um, scholars are divided. They, I mean, they are torn between believing that those uh, ladies uh, voice was excellent or perhaps that was you know, some kind of uh, you know strategy in order to please the Duke. <clears throat> uh, again there were there were still um, standards and those standards were normally met uh, and uh, of those women and others would meet those standards, they would be appreciated in, the, in their accomplishments, of course. Uh, again, what makes us uh, perhaps um, sure that those uh, ladies had this very excellent quality of, of voice would be uh, the, the fact that um, that the kind of music that uh, that they are talking about is uh, or could only have been performed by the most accomplished singers. Especially when you get to know that uh, they were, some of them were composed by uh, the high and mighty uh, court musician Lodzetschi. So, like we have seen, we have seen three different, um, you know, uh, um, time periods in which uh, we had different singers, and those um, female singers were uh, granted the status divas for different reasons. Some, some some of the criteria has, has been or have been extended so that it can accommodate um, um, more than just the voice. Then we spoke about Madonna and Callas, and we spoke about the Ferrari's ladies. Um, that's, um, I think, the end of it. So, have any questions? Because we're done with the chapter. No. So how did you find the chapter or how, how did you find the experience? Are you still there? Yes. Okay. So did it add to your knowledge? Did it um, give you insights into the world of music? Um, what kind yes. Of I, I think uh, the, the chapter is very interesting and mm -hmm. uh, uh, exposed us to, 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 many, to different kinds of uh, singers in opera and so on. And also we knew about famous uh, uh, divas in the area yeah. of singing. Yeah. And also uh, we knew about opera actors yeah. and singers and uh, the, the, the major means <coughs> the, 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 the qualities that they are possess and so on. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Any other um, ideas that you would like to share with us? Rawad, uh, Toka, Rawan. Actually, I find it very easy and interesting to study. It's not boring. 
Uh, I think you sent me an email around uh, asking if we can reduce the amount of uh, chapters in the midterm, right? Um, no, I didn't actually. Yeah. Uh, or perhaps somebody's using their email. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to start a new chapter. Uh, these are the chapters that, that we're having in the midterm. We'll have Othello, right? Othello, uh, the Duchess of Malfi. Are we doing the Duchess of Malfi? Yes, we did it. So Othello, the Duchess of Malfi, because I'm confusing courses now. So Othello, the Duchess of Malfi and the Diva. No, 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 no. <laughs> confusing courses, like I told you. We have Othello, uh, um, um, Christopher Marlowe, right? You know, which is Dr. Faustus, and then the Diva. Am I correct? The Duchess of Malfi is A to 30A, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, yes, we had the uh, Rubatra and, uh, and the Diva. Oh, yes. <laughs> did I say Othello? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm confusing courses. So we did. Uh, so we're having Cle <laughs> Cleopatra. Yes, Cleopatra and uh, Marlo. Christopher Marlo. Christopher Marlo. The last uh, is the, the Divas. And the Diva. I'm sorry. I'm confused. And the Diva. And the Diva. Yeah. OK, this is what we're having in the midterm exam, inshallah. And the midterm exam is uh, not next week. It's the week after, right? Uh, I think the um, the timetable is on uh, on the university website. Did you check that? Yes. And of course, you know that you'll have to come to the university to do the exam. Yes, right? we have only in the, in the midterm exam, we have only uh, this chapter. We were Divas and Prasovar Mars, two, two chapters. No, I think you have three, um, you have Cleopatra. Cleopatra uh, also? Uh, yeah, man, go and check because I uh, I have written that on the LMS. The I don't know. Go and, go and check. To, according to the old plan, we have only uh, chapter two, uh, Christopher Marlowe and the okay. Tiber. Let me go. Let's let's go together and see what I wrote myself. Um, let me. This is taking forever. And this is a one hundred. Can you see that? Yes. OK, so what do we have? In. Oh, yes. I think, yeah, OK, it's. Uh, OK, so it's going to be only Christopher Marlowe, Dr. Faustus and the Diva. OK, Rama? Yes, uh, just two chapters. All right, Montez. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you on this note and with this item. And I'll see you the week, not the next, the week after, inshallah. Um, when, when is the exam? Is it going to be um, on, uh, on what day, the week uh, after? Is it going to be on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? Monday. 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 So which Monday means... On Monday. So we'll we'll do uh, you'll you'll do Monday you'll you'll do the um, the exam and we're meeting anyway on Tuesday. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so yeah. next week we don't have a lecture. Next week. Next week is I think is a uh, an of yeah it's a it's a holiday because it's uh, the mid year vacation for uh, students. We, we, yeah, I think there there will be uh, like an announcement. Um, so next week we didn't have a lecture, right, Victor? We don't. No, no we're talking okay. about that now. Yeah. 
Yes, um, thank you. Um, okay, so on, on this, on, unless of course you have any questions, we, uh, um, we, we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much for attending and I'll see you. Doctor? Yeah. Uh, doctor, I want to ask you, the essay, for example, is about what? I don't know. On the... أنا أسأل اللي هو بتاع المتر مجلان؟ أيوة المتر على ال على ال أعرفش أنا. It's an essay question. Yes, doctor. Doctor, we have an essay question. An essay may be from chapter two, Christopher. And here in this chapter, maybe there is no essays except for example Madonna or the right about Madonna or our right about Madonna. لا any any of them can have uh, essay questions. We can have questions that are. طب يعني مثلا دكتور يعني على حسب تدريسك مثلا ممكن يسألنا أكتب لي مثلا ملخص عن مثلا دكتور فاوس أو ديب أو شيء زي كده. لا ما بنطلبش ملخص طبعا بنطلب تحليل. كيف يعني ما فهمت أنا. تحليل لل we gave you a, a certain point we would like you. To talk about it, and you read the chapter very well so that you can be able to. But we don't have summaries. We don't ask you to write about the biography of the writer or the author. You focus on the points that we're asking you about. When you talk about Cleopatra, for example, about the Roman sources, whether she was treated well or not. Uh, we talk about how she thought, uh, how she saw herself, um, what kind of, um, we, we talk about the different, um, you know, perceptions of her. And this is, for example, uh, Cleopatra, and of course, we don't have Cleopatra in the matter. We talk about the battles between uh, Christopher Marlowe and Dr. Faustus, how similar or how different they are, okay, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this has to be in an in, in essay form. We don't want you to write points, point one and point two and point. Yeah, we don't need that. Okay, everyone? Yes, doctor. Okay, so I... Make it easy, doctor. Sure. Yeah.